If your marriage or partnership is a container, what kind is it? Is it a milk carton, all rigid and traditional? Or is it a wicker basket just full of holes? I'm joking, kind of, but today's expert, Lana Elko, is going to ask you this very same question. Except for her, a relationship is a flexible and living thing. And it's supposed to hold you both so that it's strong enough to offer security and trust, but freeing enough to let you both grow and flourish. I absolutely loved my conversation with Lana. Uh, she's a feminine empowerment coach, uh, a tantric teacher, and she works on the energetic level to help you discover your blind spots, energetic blockages, and overall just disassemble and reassemble your expectations for a healthy, intimate, and thriving relationship. She also has a gift for you, which you can find as a link right here by this episode, or if you're listening on iTunes or somewhere else, just go to my website, flowdreaming.com, and you'll find it there. In addition, Lana's own website is lanaelcocoaching.com. Got that right. It's a mouthful. lanaelcocoaching.com. So with that, let's go chat with her. Hi, I'm Summer McStravick with flowdreaming.com. And welcome to this series, Scarcity Thinking Sucks. So Do Limiting Beliefs. So let's dissolve your limited thinking dump those scarcity thoughts, own your power, and get you back on your feet, reaching for the stars. Over the course of these episodes, you'll hear from some really brilliant minds about ways they pinpoint and blow up limiting beliefs in their specific areas of expertise. So come with me on a journey into your mind and heart, and let's see what we can find in these very enlightening conversations. Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's Summer here with Lana. You just heard me introduce her. We are ready to dive into an hour of, or not an hour, half an hour of really good, juicy discussion about being a woman, being in a relationship, um, our own feminine power, intimacy, sex. I don't know. Let's see where we go. Lana, are you ready? <laughs> but I really want to know about limitations and scarcity. So let's start with that. You know all about scarcity and limitations in relationships. So what is one that you encounter just constantly in our thoughts that just bring us below where we could be? Yes, absolutely. So excited to be here and share this with you because for me, it's my favorite topic as well. And it's kind of uh, not addressed enough uh, in the world, you know, in therapy in couple therapy and even coaching. It's uh it, it needs to be addressed at much deeper level. So I'm excited to share these pieces with you today. So the first the first thing that uh, I notice when I start working with women and just, you know, observing what is going on in this area in our society is that women, specifically women, feel, uh, often feel scarcity of love and receiving love. And I believe uh, we still have so much uh, social and cultural conditioning uh, when it comes to relationship and intimacy and the containers of our relationship. And beforehand, I want to talk about the container of marriage, some, something that is being taken for granted and not many times it is being addressed in the way I want to address it. So usually we have this, you know, Redesigned expectations, what it is, and we believe that this is actually the best container for long lasting, beautiful, loving relationships, right? And we just like inherited from our society, from our family beliefs, and um, we don't really investigate what it actually means and what it includes and how it holds our relationship, right? So, usually, women have this uh, also, they learn certain relationship rules, how it works, right? Uh, from our society, from movies, from parents. And we then we just like follow these rules and show up in a certain way and like being a good girl, what I'm supposed to do to have beautiful, yes. loving relationship and receive love, right? And or to get we, that relationship in the first place, right? Yeah, to get. There's like yeah. a set of thoughts that we have, well, I have to act this way, be this way, et cetera, to even get that relationship. 
Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Dating, how we should date, what we should do, what we should say, how we should dress, you know, what men like, you know, yeah. completely not centered within ourselves, but like what, what we're supposed to do, what we should, all the shoes, right? Then like what is next, like engagement. This is how we should do engagement. This is what he should do. This is what I should do. How romance works. By the way, I discern uh, romance and intimacy. These are different things. <laughs> romance is more like, how we should do it, right? What is normal? So we can read those signs. And intimacy is something that comes from within and it's completely authentic and unique. So we follow that romance and then we have engagement and then have a marriage. And many times engagement is like, okay, it's the ultimate win. (laughs) And there's like nothing after that is like... You know, just, Life is done. <laughs> the game is conquered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. This is what they see, like in the market, like some coaches, like, oh, my client got engaged. You know, this mm-hmm. is such a win. Like, well, it's just the beginning. <laughs> wait, wait a little bit what will come with marriage. And then we enter that container with such a high expectations and like in this euphoria. And then we face... Uh, all this conditioning and all these pre-designed kind of um, rules of how it works. Like the, it's a container, it's something that's supposed to hold our relationship and create certain conditions so our relationship grow and thrive and we sustain this uh, you know, level of intimacy and truth and and growth and connection, right? But it's not happening because the marriage container was designed long, long time ago, like in, in old patriarchal times when women didn't have any rights and freedoms, when the marriage was actually many times a trap for women and they didn't even have choice uh, to choose their partner, right? So, and since then, that container was not uh, uh, upgraded, you know, it's, so it's like there is like a little bit maybe with feminist movement, which was a good movement at the time to <laughs> say, okay, it doesn't work anymore. But still, when we go deeper and look how it actually works, it's still very, very conditioned, very old container that doesn't really work well uh, for us anymore, especially for women. So then women, you know, do all these things, do all these obligations. It's like rule based and like many times it's fear based. And yeah, then it's contractual like, well, based. I'll do this yeah. and you do that. But if you're not doing that, then I'm not going to do this. So what you're saying is that a lot of us enter marriages with a, a an assumption, which is actually a kind of limitation because we have a container in our minds of what it is or should be. And so does the partner and they may or may not match, but they also might be a very outmoded, um, uh, old fashioned um, mm-hmm. sort of box that we're just conditioned to automatically believe. Is that a, yeah. another way of, of saying it? Like to, I'm just trying to identify what is the limitation in our, it's really an expectations that we then mold ourselves into to fit. And that's how we end up changing in relationships, not always for the best molding ourselves. Yeah. to. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, uh... There are certain things that um, I discovered <laughs> while working with women and doing my own work that is also the marriage. It's not about the, you know, the the word itself, right? It doesn't matter whether somebody is married or not. It's just the container itself, the way we do it. Uh, this container is not aligned with the universal laws of energy, right? The energy doesn't work that way. They, even like loving, beautiful relationship uh, are not going to su- survive in this container because it's not aligned with the universal laws of energy. And I like to give an example of the law of rhythm, right? Everything going through cycles, ups and downs, you know, like night and day, tides and ocean, inhale, exhale. And the same happens in our relationship. It's very natural to connect and disconnect, like a dance, right? Like you step back, you step forward. And this is like something that nobody teaching on a deeper level that it's actually beautiful to be able to naturally disconnect from your partner. And this is an opportunity to connect with ourselves and sustain our autonomy as an individual, you know, with the, you know, like many people feel, well, I lose my freedom when I get married. It's like, that doesn't need to happen. If you allow that natural disconnect, you kind of stepping back completely. Like it doesn't, disconnect, it doesn't mean like you go for, you know, for a short trip and then you text your 
husband all the time and like feeling like what are they doing you know like no like allowing that complete energetic disconnect so you can reconnect in more passionate and more fresh way because while you disconnect you also charge yourself with different energy that is not um you know, being generated in the closed container. So you bring something new and it's refreshing and exciting. Uh, I have a question about that. I know you could, I know you're like, no, I've got the next thing to say. But (laughs) when I have worked with people over time, something often comes up and it's usually, it's usually a female partner. um, And she'll say something like, my partner is not growing the way that I'm growing. I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm opening myself. I'm searching, I'm becoming more mindful, I'm opening my empathic skills. I mean, just searching, you know, growing. And my partner mm-hmm. is just the same. And it feels like they're getting more and more negative. It feels like they are, I can't share this with them. And they they see this as a problem, like their partner should be 100% completely connected with them all the time. It's what it's making me think of what you just said. When mm-hmm. in, instead, you're saying a, different, a shift on that is, Actually, you need to have those moments away. You need to have that separation Um, because like Mm -hmm. you said, it's a dance where you step together and step away. So maybe it's not the horrible, terrible marriage breaking up thing that we think it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. And it's also, I see it as a collective pattern because it happens all the time. Uh, The the roots uh, for this challenge, and it can be also like too much of disconnect, right? Because it's like... It's a cycle, so we do need to reconnect, right. and then we need to deep. come back at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I understand those women who feel like, well, I disconnect, and then he can't catch up <laughs> with me. So it's like the, this uh, separation is gro- the walls of separation uh, are growing, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the limited thought comes in, and we'll never get back together. And I made a mistake, or I want to leave, and I can't because I couldn't support myself, live alone, disappoint the kids, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the, the roots of this uh, challenge I see in general in the difference how we are wired and um, how our emotions work. So men pro- process emotions like five to ten times slower than women, and it makes them like grow like in the, in the way that, you know, connected with emotional intelligent emotional emotional growth as well slower so they catch up we just need to give them time each time we have a moment when we want to share we want to have understanding we want to have that intimacy where it's like oh i get i get you what you're saying and being open in that space where like he wants to know right he wants to learn uh, we, we do need to give them more time to process because we're moving much much faster in terms of our emotional growth and our capacity to express ourselves with words, mm-hmm. and to translate um, our emotions into words. And men, like, that's why they, they have nothing to say. We are going so fast. So it's, go- it's good to break it down and give them time to process step by step and find that pace that works for them. You know, usually it takes them, like, <laughs> at least one day <laughs> to process <laughs> something. Not <laughs> so quick. That Come back. Yeah, not quick. But this is mm-hmm. this is how the polarity is born. Because when you look at sexuality, by the way, it's the opposite. Men uh, get aroused much faster, and uh, they move through the the whole um, sexual process, right, of sexual connection, much faster. It's like fiery, very fast energy. And women are the opposite. It takes them much, much longer, like also five to ten times longer to warm up, to open up, to, you know, it's always through emotional intimacy that we can open up also sexually on a physical level. So this is kind of counterbalanced uh, in different, like, areas of intimacy so we just need to know the differences and most of the time we don't have enough education to understand these things so then we have our hurt feelings and like disappointment and blaming each other so instead of learning how it actually works how do you address this then i mean it sounds to me like um it's it's a question of being imbalanced because you know, the one partner may be taking longer and the other person is going much faster Then they have to catch up, but then you're also catching up to them in a different way. So how do you, like, mm-hmm. do, you, do you, what do you do to kind of get people back into the rhythm and the, and the flow of it, really? Mm-hmm. Is there techniques yeah, or like, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so the, beforehand, we have to look at the big picture and understand why, you know, this, uh, 
container itself doesn't work because it's like so automated people don't even know what they sign up for right we need to investigate and understand what kind of container we want to co-create and instead of marriage just for the sake of you know discerning these two different containers i like to introduce people to the container of the sacred union it's it comes from tantra right so sacred union is the con- relationship container that is based on truth and growth not any kind of shoulds not you know what we believe you know how it should work because everybody says so or like what we ideally want you know how it should work in our dreams right every easy and flow and all this Uh, but it's uh, it's based on what is actually going on right now within us and in between us and then what is the direction we want to move together and this container is uh, agreement-based. It's pre-arranged agreements that we make with each other based on also a few ed- educational pieces, differences between women, men and women, the type of personalities they will have, the different archetypes that we represent, right? There, were, there is such diversity of different personalities and people, I mean, women and men, archetypes, and we just try to put them in the same universal container of marriage that is not even clearly defined. So a uh, sacred union is very defined and very based on, you know, absolute clarity. Okay, what are we creating? What are we doing? What, what is going on? You know? Yeah. So in a nutshell. I think this is, I'm sure everything you're saying also applies to differently gendered people or, or different gendered, you know, partnerships as well. I mean, so it's not just man or woman or, you know, it's whatever you're identifying. You're, you're probably still falling into the same uh, disconnect in the ways that you're, you know, growing or receiving or <laughs> et cetera, like you're, like you're saying. Have you yeah, seen that absolutely. to be true? Yeah. Because it's like a feminine and a masculine energy, you know, we all have that inside. So some mm-hmm. people have more masculine, even women have sometimes more masculine energy and some men have feminine energy, which is also, also it's beautiful because it's how we can connect as well. And when it comes to different uh, couples who may be the same gender, they still pull these pieces together, these polarities of feminine and masculine, that energy is yeah. still in play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So when you, um, when you start to change your understanding of the container, when you start to put these, uh, what are you, pre-decided on rules together, um, it means kind of constructing really a whole new container is what it sounds like. Do you, do you, in your work, do you lead people through that process? Cause yes. You- I'm saying to do it, I'm like, how the heck would I know where to even start on that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's what my work is. You know, that's what is uh, the foundation of my work to help people first to to build the containers before they start doing what they want to experience and you know feel and all of that. We need to build the right container that actually can hold their desires and the deepest level of intimacy like most women really desire that extremely deep level of intimacy when they are so loved and when they merge with another you know like feeling that oneness and like you know when there there are no walls of separation it's like a dream of many women come in and to work with me it's like well before we get there we need to clear the space let go of all these limiting beliefs and then start over (laughs) yes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely I wonder too it makes me it makes me think how you know a lot of uh, long-term partnerships they start to experience um, decreases in intimacy Um, I can't tell you how many people I've spoken with and they're like well we don't even sleep in the same bedroom anymore Um, but we're kind of okay with it we're used to it and and I've always wondered: Is that because you've just been together so long? You just you, you got bored of each other, or uh, is it because one person grew in one direction, the other in another, but they still love each other? It sounds like what you're saying, though, is that um, there's something else there. There's something to do with allowing yourself to be very truthful and intimate uh, in your even in your expectations with your partner, and and lacking that then all the physical pieces also start to fall away or fall fall aside. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it's just like a mm. huge question. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I would say everybody faces it. Anybody who 
stays in the relationship long enough to <laughs> arrive to that point, for sure. And especially in this container of marriage that, as I said, like it's so universal and so like, there's so much enmeshment as well, like the sexuality linked to practicalities and survival and security that actually pulls all sexuality is a wild animal it's not it's <laughs> not gonna follow the rules that like is it provided for me or not you know like, so <laughs> i'm gonna make that the title of this interview sexuality <laughs> is a wild animal that's gonna get a lot of viewers <laughs> No. <laughs> yes, like understanding what sexuality sexuality is not quite this unconditional love it, it's actually quite conditional it requires certain conditions uh, and i like the metaphor of wild animal because the wild animal never gives in to any rules it's wild you know like it just follows instincts you know and if you connect with these instincts and connect with the animal it will get closer and closer with to you and you can develop relationship but you can't cage you can put this animal in the cage because then it loses that initial you know energy that you were attracted to this is what happens in relationships all the time a man was so attracted with this free beautiful powerful woman and then mm-hmm. They get married, and then he starts oppressing that part of her, of hers um, that he was attracted to. Yeah. <laughs> and she's mm-hmm. just like, "Why is it happening?" <laughs> you know, yeah. because mm-hmm. they don't understand what sexuality is. It cannot be tamed because it loses loses its attractiveness, and it it kills that also fire within ourselves when we feel wild and free, and we, you know, we can, you know, choose to move forward or back off like this is natural like we start to do feel like we're obliged to have sex you know we're obliged to sleep in the same room or in the same bed all the time we're obliged to share a bank account we're obliged to like support each other this way and we, like there are so many obligations that it just cages the wild animal and that's why it's happening you know I almost see a checklist um, when you're setting up the new container for marriage. Do we want to be able to have a separate room now and then? Do we want to take separate vacations? Do we want to have that time for our own growth? Do we want to merge our accounts or not? Right? Do you do you really just go in there and sort of fundamentally reconstruct what this agreement is going to be between the, the two people? Yes, absolutely, because there is no black and white. Some people like to spend more time together. Some people need more private space. They're introverts, extroverts. There are different archetypes, different types of personalities. So based on who I'm working with, we design the container based on what, what is natural for them. What is the the environment they they thrive? What do they need? You know, How they need to be supported? How much freedom they want to have, how often they need that disconnect, because each person have different frequency and different rhythm, right? Uh, And then, like, some people are more compatible than others, right? So it's like, it's like unique design. It's basically, I like to say, like, treating your relationship as a work of art. It's like, it's like an art project. So, okay, let's co-create this you know, a masterpiece of our relationship and treat it this way. We're not dropping back into casualty of everyday routine. And it just like, it's not, not working. It, it's not working that way. <laughs> yeah. What do you think for women in particular? Because you touched on this a few minutes ago, um, that, that the classic idea of a partnership or marriage is very um, patriarchal. I mean, it comes from mm-hmm. a more masculine, you know, culture back back when and what kind of rebalancing needs to be done in in us in in people who identify as female that were we feel i need this i need i need to put this into the container now this is this is where i bring my strength into it uh or what are the pieces that you see that women need most to change for themselves for their to bring the feminine in Mm -hmm. yeah that's a very deep question right <laughs> we've got all the time in the world no we don't but <laughs> maybe a, a one idea like maybe one thing that you see almost all of your clients requesting or needing or something yes yes um well beforehand is understanding what is feminine and, and what is not and 
not falling into wounded feminine, obviously, because there are two extremes of understanding feminine right now. And we're we're coming out of that because there is a huge movement right now in the collective consciousness and, and it's a planetary pr- process when women are rising to their power and they start to understand what feminine is because it's been forgotten for like for thousands of years women were not powerful they were just cut off power so we're just like awakening and there is a level of confusion there <laughs> still like what is it and how do we apply it you know <laughs> in our relationship in everyday life so that's the bridge that has to be built so there is lots of inner work that women need to do to understand what is the feminine and how they can utilize it actually in the still very patriarchal world right so this there is a challenge and there are two extremes it's like the wounded feminine is like thinking that feminine is like passive and submissive and like agreeable this kind of like <laughs> shapeless kind of <laughs> creature no you know, boundaries and, just yeah no boundaries a pile like, of mush that was like the idea of like women being in service to to the masculine all the time however it's actually contradicts um, i will say it in a moment the it because it contradicts our original divine design of what is feminine and what is masculine what's the relationship between them Uh, the second uh, extreme is like women become men that happened after the feminist movement because well it it made sense why it happened it was beautiful at the time but now the pendulum swings and it often swings all the way Mm -hmm. Yeah, so women became powerful. So they, they basically they became men. They embodied the masculine, and they then they started to struggle with the relationship because yeah, it wor- it works in terms of business and career. It works. Oh, I remember those boxy shoulder pads from the eighties. Oh, suit yeah. lasers. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I know what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it's true though. It even became fashion. You know, mm-hmm. put on your suit, ladies, and. Your big shoulder pads and bulk up like yeah. the dudes. Yeah, that totally was the product of the feminism. <laughs> <laughs> kind of an but, odd side effect, but yeah. <laughs> I love that that you brought it up. I kind of yeah, I remember those. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever go back and look at those old pictures. You will you will cringe. You will cringe. <laughs> oh well. Um. So, like, women became masculine, and it creates power struggle in intimate relationships. So you can't actually drop into deep intimacy because two masculine energies in the intimate space, they fight. This is the power struggle of, like, you can see in nature two Two males. lions. Yeah, yeah, they always fight for mm-hmm. something, for females, for food, for territory. But females never fight. If you look at nature, the same species, so that females never fight. They share. They, they take care of each other's babies. They you know, they're being in peace with each other. So this is not our nature to fight. This is when we are now masculine. So that now we're like fi- trying to find what is that empowered feminine and how it it really works. What is really, what is what is the definition and how we can actually apply it while still living in this uh, very masculine, you know, environment. And the, the way I love to introduce women to feminine is through tantric practices and expanded states of consciousness because feminine is connected with expanded states of consciousness. She's a visionary leader and the masculine leadership is um, executive, like make things happen, you know, in this physical form. We are like extracting that vision from the fields of possibility in the universe and the masculine energy makes it material, right? Like physical so th- this is the different one of the pieces that i bring in uh, and uh, when we do practices that are extremely highly experiential with women they tap in naturally in their own body into this uh, feminine power and what it is and how to navigate it, this expanded states of consciousness and then this is actually a gateway to the deepest level of intimacy in tantra we call it transformational level when we actually merge in the one in one through expanded states and through navigating those states and eventually leading our partner through these gates because the masculine on its own can never experience the deepest level of intimacy, which is physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. Uh, all these components are important. Uh, so we're actually leading our partner into this place because on their own, they will not uh, get there. They will s- get stuck on like 
reproductive re- and recreational level of sexuality and sexual connection. Uh, it's the woman who opens these gates and guides them through expanded states of consciousness into the depth of intimacy, which is extremely a beautiful spiritual experience. It's like mystical experience. So I love to use uh, experiential tools like that. Um, we use breath, movement, and sound. And I use background music sets that I create and I guide women into those states and they start to navigate it so they see and experience it in their body. So you work with them uh, in themselves. They don't have to have a partner with them. It's you find it in yourself first so that then you can sort of gift it or share it with your partner. Yes, we start with, uh, I start to work with women usually, uh, and we have this journey and we do he- lots of healing and releasing the conditioning. Then we do this experiential mm. part when they like experience what is possible in inside their internal, you know, Sounds intimate universe. Yeah. And then they can, and the, uh, the last phase is when they actually, we bring the partner in and she learns how to guide him to be this intimate leader. And he yeah. learns how feminine works. And she's leading through receiving, I love to say, say it. It might sound uh, country too. I love but, that. Leading through but receiving. But woman is a receiver in their relationship with men originally, right? Because we receive sperm and then we give life. So we, initially we're, we need to receive in order to right. give. That's brilliant. And it, and it also kind of actually answers that that question from a few minutes ago. What is it that you often see women really, really require in order to bring up the femininity in that container? And obviously, that would be a giant thing for them to be able to bring into the marriage or bring into the partnership um, to kind of help help rebalance things. I guess you could say, um, Lana. God, this has been amazing. <laughs> My mind is all, I just, I'm thinking so much. I'm like thinking about my own marriage. I'm thinking about other people. <laughs> um, I want to ask you before we wrap things up, I know that you have um, ways that people can reach out to you if this fascinates them as well. Um, maybe you have something you can offer them and kind of give them a little taste of what you do and your work. Do you want to share about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are so many pieces that I can share, but um, my favorite is actually to start with this, you know, inventory mm-hmm. of what is this contain relationship container we have right now, which there are lots of unconscious pieces there, right? Like, let's say marriage, somebody's married and they want to change things. They want to like find that deepest level of intimacy, right? So where to start? Uh, I love to start with inventory. Okay, what is this? What are the beliefs that we have right now, even if they're unconscious, like maybe they're taken from culture, that we're still applying and we're relying on these beliefs uh, in our marriage, in our relationship? And what is that our own truth and desire, how we want it instead? And really just uh, practicing discernment was like, okay, this comes from culture, conditioning, you know, all of this collective wounding, personal trauma. And this comes from me of how I want to be and what I want to receive. And that's what I really feel. And the best way to address that is to look uh, on your internal conflict. You know, when you feel like I should do this, but I feel like doing this, or this is how I'm supposed to feel but I feel this. So this is a good way to start. And I want to share a link to my video where I actually break it down and um, it's kind of look behind the curtain. What is going on in marriages right now? I and love that. Life. Yeah. I, I want to, I want to get this, this checklist and this inventory or, or the video. <laughs> I'm going to, I want to do it myself. So um Great. So what I'll do is uh, I will put a link, obviously. So anybody who is watching, listening right now, um, you'll be able to uh, go. Well, you should be able to see it pretty much right now. (laughs) So um, yeah. Okay. Let's get it. Let's do this. Thank you, Lana. You're welcome. It has been a real pleasure meeting you for the first time. Um, I just love the energy of your soul and the way that you think. Um, So I'm really glad that I reached out and found you. Thank you, Sam. It was an incredible interview and I really enjoyed it and I hope it was helpful. I think a lot of people are going to be pondering this for the rest of the day and reconsidering what they've gotten themselves into 
why they made it that way and how things can be very, very different now going forward. So thank you. (laughs) All right. I'll talk to you again someday, I hope. Until then, bye, everybody. Bye-bye.